Um, today I'm going to, I have a little cold, so excuse me for my voice. I'm going to discuss affidavits today. And affidavits are an extremely important part of uh, getting your case uh, dismissed and winning your uh, case in court. Um, I've been studying Robert Fox's uh, stuff a little bit lately, and Robert Fox is a, a rather amazing man who won 11 out of 11 of the cases against him. And the government has persecuted this man, and yet he still managed to be victorious against him. Robert Fox made the statement, which I believe to be 100% true, that only about half a percent of the uh, uh, cases in Texas are successfully uh, defended against. So your chances of winning are next to nothing. And I don't know how, what percentage of those people are represented by lawyers, but it doesn't really matter because let's say um, you know 20% of those cases or 10% of those cases, they actually pay money out of their pocket to hire a lawyer. And, the, and maybe in 60% um, of the cases or 70, 80%, they have public defenders. They all lose. Their track record for winning is zilch. So you might as well just save your money, defend yourself, learn how to defend yourself, and your chances of winning go up dramatically. Robert Fox's technique in winning his court cases is to put in affidavits. And, you know, the more I um, look into defending myself in court, the more, I, the more I see and the clearer the picture becomes for me. So the way I look at it at the present is, is that the courts are all administrative courts. They're not courts of law under the Constitution. Administrative courts only operate on your consent. Typically, they have to have your consent. And one of the most interesting things that you see if you go to court a lot is you'll see that people uh, will plead guilty or no contest, and they'll be given a um, small fine. Like, let's say that you're in there for a misdemeanor, and the fine is six months in jail and uh, $500 and the district attorney will make an offer to you that if you pay $150 and get a year's probation that um, you can settle the account. So what's a year's probation, right? They tell you on, under your probation you're to obey all laws. Think about that for a minute. If while you, you have to sign an agreement with the DA that you will obey all laws, well if, if why is that different from the average position? Obviously, you don't have to obey all laws, right? It's your signed agreement that makes you um, have to obey all laws. Because if everybody has to obey all laws naturally, then they, they don't need to put that in on a probation that you sign your name to as a contract. You already have that uh, duty. So apparently, you don't have the duty to obey all laws. See, you have to think about why they're doing things and, you know, just examine it for a minute. So anyway, um, getting back to defending yourself, this is, you know, most of these defenses that I'm proposing, in fact, all of the defenses that I propose, have nothing to do with defending yourself if you're guilty of injuring somebody or causing them a loss. If you've caused somebody harm or loss, then you can't use common law as a defense. I'm only talking to the people that are accused of victimless crimes, where, you know, I mean, if you were driving drunk and nobody got hurt, that's a victimless crime. I'm not suggesting that people should drive drunk. I'm suggesting that people be responsible for themselves and their own affairs. But, you know, there's a huge difference between having a couple of beers and being, you know, 99% uh, cognizant of your abilities and being smashed. You know, I mean, if your blood alcohol level is 2.0, then you are severely um, limited in your capability compared to your normal state. I think that people need to be responsible for themselves. And we should 
try to be responsible for ourselves. On the other hand, I don't think somebody should have to pay huge amounts of money to the state and possibly go to jail if nobody was harmed or injured. However, if they were going to collect, you know, $5,000, then it should go to the people that have been killed by drunk drivers and not to the state. That's the only real legitimate purpose of punishing those for, you know, indiscretions. So let's get back to the process of um, making a correct affidavit. I'm going to point out to you that when you go to court and you're in an administrative setting, it's all let's make a deal. So when you go to court and you start watching what goes on in court, you can see it's all let's make a deal. What's the offer? What's the acceptance? You know, the DA is going to make you an offer. If they don't accept the offer, you're going to plead, right? Pleading is accepting an offer. It's an offer to plead. And if you don't plead, guilty, not guilty, or no contest, the judge will plead for you. He doesn't have any authority to do that. And, but the point of it is, is that you have to consent to go into jail. Because in a contractual arrangement, in administrative court, it's contractual. Where's the contract? What contract did I enter into that I would obey all the vehicle code laws, or all the penal code laws, or the civil code, or the laws, the rules of court, rules of court. Are those laws? Or are they just rules that this court happened to make up for operating in their place of business? See, because the court is really a business. It's a private business out for hire. And these, the private business men are the judges, the district attorneys, the attorneys, the bar card carrying attorneys. It's all a business and it's all a private business. They're not even a part of the state. As I've proved in my video on the courts are not the government. I showed evidence of that. So what you have is, a, is an administrative court that relies on you making an agreement. When you are sentenced, you agree to that sentence and they want you to sign your name on the minutes showing that you've accepted that sentence. What happens if you refuse to consent? I've personally witnessed somebody who refused to consent and they didn't know what to do. It was, it was really remarkable to watch. But anyway, so we go back to um, the, the point that I'm going to make here is it's administrative and I view the judge and I believe you should view the judge as, you know, the three monkeys that see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil. So I look at the judge as, instead of him sitting on the bench like you, you view him, him or her, just view him like this. This is the position that the judge is in. I can't see anything and I can't hear anything. And he can't see anything and he can't hear anything until you force him to. When you stand up in court and the judge asks you questions uh, and you answer them, it's all about getting an agreement. It's all about a contract. I'm going to say this and you are going to agree to it. You have to object to everything he says, right? If you don't object to it, then you have acquiesced. Acquiesced means, you know, the California Civil Code has a nice little sp spot in there where it says, the, um, the law honors the vigilant before those who slumber on their rights. Slumber on their rights. What's slumbering on your rights? If you say, you know, you're violating my right. You know, I have a right to a jury trial. You're violating my right. Oh no, I'm going to have a bench trial. We're not going to have a jury trial. Well, if you don't stand up and say I have a right to a jury trial, it says so right in the California Constitution, or it says so right in the Texas Constitution. If you don't stand up and say, I, I demand a jury trial, then you have slumbered on your rights. Do you see that? You have to object. You have to state what you want. You have to say, I don't consent to contract with this court. I'm here under threat and duress only. 
But anyway, you can say, you can go on and on for two hours with a beautiful tirade about all these court cases that support your opinion and blah, blah, blah. You know what the judge is doing? Blah, 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 blah. I can't hear you. You know why he can't hear you? Because you haven't forced him to hear you. So how do you force him to hear you? When a jury decides whether you're guilty or not, they look at two aspects, as I discussed before. They look at the law and they look at the facts. And the judge will say, I will determine the law and you will determine the facts. The jury is, to, is there to decide whether the facts are there. So it's like in an IRS case. I determined that he has a lawful duty to file his income tax return and he's, you know, if he didn't file it, it's willful failure to file. Well, what gave the judge the authority to make that determination? Nothing. He just stated it. And the jury slumbered on their rights when they didn't realize it was their duty to decide whether the law was being violated or not. Because I have half a dozen court cases that state the jury has the authority and the duty to judge both the law and the facts. But if the jury members don't stand up and, and uh, don't uh, invoke their rights and don't, you know, he's not guilty on violating the law and he's not guilty or he, you know, he did fail to file, but we find him not guilty because there's no, we find no law was violated. We determined that he didn't break a law. That's the jury making a determination that there was no law that was broken even though the facts may prove out that he didn't file a return. And the jury can do that, and no jury member can ever be sent to prison for voting their conscience. Voting their conscience is making a determination about who's guilty and who's not. So like I said, unless you force the judge to view your, your law and hear your words, he doesn't have to because the little rules of court that they go by allow him to disregard everything. The judge can make any determination he wants and if you go to court enough times you will see just that. I have seen the judges say that the that the laws that they're that you are supposed to be bound by the codes not laws I've shown the judge evidence that uh, that the bankers um, failed to have a um, affidavit signed by the beneficiary in an unlawful detainer case that it states in under a California Civil Code that the beneficiary must state on a notice of default under penalty of perjury you have failed to make your payments. And the notice of default that they filed was obviously fraudulent but there was no statement on there under penalty of perjury so I said it was invalid and the judge said so <laughs> So the judges have no problem violating the law. And if you think otherwise, you're in for a rude awakening. So how do you force them to see anything? You can't force a judge to see anything, but you can get it in the record, right? You can get it in the record. And what his, the judge is worried about and concerned about is somebody higher up looking over his shoulder and going, yep, you did, you know, you did this wrong. Judges are not immune. They have two things that can uh, violate their immunity to being prosecuted. One is that they don't have any jurisdiction after they've been challenged on having jurisdiction and they don't prove they have jurisdiction. They can be held criminally liable or civilly liable, pay money, for violating your rights and proceeding without jurisdiction. The other thing is due process. If you can prove that the judge denied you due process, denied you your rights, right, then he doesn't have any immunity for that. So a due process violation would be, I'm putting, I want, I, I'm subpoenaing somebody to testify on my behalf and the judge says I'm not going to allow that testimony. Well, you've denied me the right to be heard, right, you've denied the jury the right to hear the information, or in a court you know, in a bench trial where the judge is the jury, you've denied that evidence to be put into the record. You can't do that without it being a due process violation. 
So when you go to court and start speaking, it's all, imagine the judge doing this, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't hear any of it, and he doesn't have to hear any of it, even if there's somebody there typing away at, their, at the stenographer's um, thing. The only thing that can be make that you can make a rule on is a you know finding and finding of facts and conclusions of law. That's it. Finding of facts. What facts are present and what facts are true, and the conclusions of law. What laws apply, and which how are we going to make a judicial determination based on those laws? If you look at a court as a long series of building blocks from the beginning of time, right? Somebody stole somebody's sheep, you know, 3,000 years ago, and somebody decided that that was wrong and that there was a law against the stealing of sheep. So they could trot into court and accuse him and say, you know, under Moses' Ten Commandments, he violated the law, thou shalt not steal. And you're going to have a group that makes a determination whether that was true or not. What facts do you have that he stole the sheep? Well, some neighbor who was walking by witnessed it. Okay, so he's going to get on the stand and testify. Now, in the Bible, it says a fact is established by two or more witnesses. So think about that. A fact is established by two or more witnesses. So do we see where the he said, she said rule comes from? In other words, if your accuser says you're guilty of beating somebody with a baseball bat and you say, no, I'm not, you're at a standoff. You can't get a conviction like that. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't get you to agree that you are guilty at sentencing. You may agree to it. You may acquiesce to it. You may say it's okay with you because you slumber on your rights. But nobody can have one witness against them and be found guilty. Two witnesses is another story. The Bible also says the punishment for giving, bearing false witness is you know, you go to hell for that, right? So, so, so the two things that are important in a court case are the law and the facts. Now, just because you state them on your paperwork and you get it file stamped doesn't mean the judge has to look at it. So how do you force him to look at it? You force him to look at it with compulsory judicial notice. Under California Rules of Evidence 451, it states that it's compulsory judicial notice to take notice of the following. Basically, what you're stating in there is, you know, the constitutions and all laws in pursuance thereof and all decisional law. What's decisional law? Court cases. Doesn't matter what state they're in either. But certainly Supreme Court cases are pretty strong evidence. So if you put a Supreme Court case in and the judge rules in against what the Supreme Court stated was true, then he's going to have a problem. Now, the point is that he doesn't have to look at your court cases unless you tell him that he has to. And that's what judicial notice is. And com there's nothing better than compulsory judicial notice. I mean, if the rule of the state is that he has to take compulsory judicial notice, then he doesn't have an out. The only thing he can do is find other court cases that are contrary to the court case you cite. Now, if I put in that the court has to take compulsory judicial notice, I have to back that up, don't I? And that's where what what makes him liable to follow the evidence code 451 why does he have to do that well because he has a contract what's the contract the judge has he has an oath to the constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof so you have to put his contract into the record and then you have to cite all of your positions, right? This way you've bottled him up and you've forced him to look at the law that you've cited. 
The next thing is the facts. Now the facts are going to be, you know, you're going to have facts that show that you're not liable. Such as, um, let's say, the facts are I declined to take a breathalyzer test or have my blood drawn. I refused as the officer had no probable cause to arrest me for drunk driving because they pulled me over at a, a DUI checkpoint, let's say. And once, and even though they had no suspicion that I was drunk, they asked me to take a breathalyzer and have, or have blood drawn, and I refused, at which point they forced me. See? So you're going to note these facts, and how you note the facts is on an affidavit. If you file an affidavit, the affidavit will be a record of all the law and the facts that you have to support yourself. Now, if you write everything out on an affidavit and you get it notarized or you have it witnessed by two people and you get it file stamped and put into the record, is that admissible in court? Does the court have to look at your affidavit? No. The court doesn't have to look at your affidavit because it's hearsay. So we're going to go down what is hearsay. Because these, these are very important points. I've made them before. Hearsay is anything that occurs outside the view of the court. In other words, if it didn't happen in the courtroom, it's hearsay. That's an easy way to look at it. So if, if there's a police report, did that happen inside the courtroom? No. If there's a, a promissory note, did that happen inside the courtroom? No. If there's a statement from a witness written down on an affidavit, did that affidavit get recorded in the courtroom? No. Anything that doesn't get recorded in the courtroom is hearsay evidence. So anything they bring up against you, it's all hearsay evidence. The only thing that stops it from being hearsay evidence is when somebody comes to court and swears in, I swear under penalty of perjury, the evidence I'm about to testify to is true and correct, so help me God. There you go. You swear in in front of the clerk of the court, and now, once you're sworn in, everything you say is testimony. And all testimony in court that is sworn to is evidence that goes into the evidence file. That's the only fact and law that's presented. Everything else that isn't, bef if you were not, when you show up in court and you haven't sworn in, everything you say is blah, 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 blah. It's not testimony. It may sound like testimony to you. I'm saying that the cop dragged me out of the car and beat me and blah, blah, and they're just going blah, blah. I don't hear anything you're saying. It's not going into the record. It's not a fact because you didn't testify to it. So do you see the power of testimony? Testimony is the only thing that counts. It's the only thing that can be entered as fact. And so until you testify, you have nothing in court. And it, the same is true for the other side. Until the other side presents a witness who swears in, gets on the stand and testifies, there's nothing. The other aspect of testimony is, is that you have a right to face your accuser and you have a right to cross-examine his testimony or examine his testimony. So if the other side presents a police officer and he's going to testify, you have a right to ask him questions and to find out his knowledge and competency. Every man is um, assumed to be knowledgeable about the law. And who would be more knowledgeable about the law than somebody who is a law enforcement officer? And if they're not knowledgeable about the law, then they're incompetent. The minute they don't know the answer to some key relevant questions, they're incompetent. Such as, 
you know, you were speeding, you, which was driving a motor vehicle in excess of the posted speed limit. I'm sorry, sir. Um, I don't understand. What's a motor vehicle? What's the legal definition of motor vehicle? If he doesn't know what the legal definition is, then he's incompetent to state that you were driving one, right? What's the legal definition of driving? You can understand this because let's say the law was anybody driving a quizzle route over 40 miles an hour on a public highway is guilty of a crime. And he says you were driving a quizzle route. Well, what's a quizzle route? I don't know what a quizzle route is. What's a quizzle route? Because if you don't know what a quizzle route is, what the legal definition is, how do you know that I had one and that I was driving it? Uh, would this law apply if it was in Japan? If you were in Japan, could you give me a ticket for driving a quizzle route over 40 miles an hour? No, only if I was in the state of California. Okay, so what's the state of California? If you don't know these definitions, and if you don't know how they apply and where your jurisdiction comes from, you're incompetent to testify. So what we're talking about here is when you go to court, even if you file paperwork into the record, nothing, uh, nothing means much unless you've established facts and law and they are in evidence. And the judge wants to be the gatekeeper of putting stuff into evidence. So I've been in court when they present, uh, you know, a copy of the be of the deed of trust from the recorder's office, and they show it to both sides, and they go, "I'm going to put this into evidence and mark it Exhibit One." Do you have any objection to that? If you if you do, you know, you can say, "I object. This is not a co true copy of the." Um, a deed of trust, whatever. You can make your objections, but there's a, there are a few um, exceptions to the hearsay rule, and one of them is publicly recorded documents that are certified, or originals would be even better. But if you've got a stamp and a seal from the state applied to a document that is publicly recorded, then that is admissible and nobody can object to it. I personally don't like that rule, but that's the way it is. So here we go. How do you get your facts and law into the record? And how do you keep out their facts and law? Because if they don't have any facts and they don't have any law, then you can't be found guilty. So you're going to introduce facts and law through your testimony. And one way, one easy way to get it all out without bumbling about on the witness stand and trying to get the correct information out is to write it down where you can go over it in the, you know, safety and freedom of your own home. And you're going to do that on an affidavit. The affidavit is going to become your testimony and list all the things that you're testifying to. And then when you are in court, you're going to swear in, swear yourself in, and testify that you put the affidavit into the record and you demand that it be put into the evidence file or, you, or admitted as evidence. The other side is not going to be able to object to this because it's not hearsay you are testifying in court that that is your affidavit. It's been notarized by a public official and or it's been witnessed by two parties. And what makes it admissible is your testimony. Just like if somebody takes a photograph and puts it into the record and says, I want to admit this as evidence, what would you say to that? You'd say, I object, that's hearsay, because the photograph was taken outside of court. So it's not something that occurred inside of court. So the only way to bring that in as evidence is to have somebody who took the picture state and testify that I took that picture on this day, and that is an exact replica of the scene that I witnessed.
what's what's the other side going to say there are somebody is testifying that they witnessed the scene and they captured it on film on that camera see it's their testimony that makes it admissible as evidence without the testimony that picture is inadmissible so if the cops have pictures of the crime scene it's inadmissible as evidence unless the photographer who took it is going to show up at the trial and testify that that is the camera picture that I took on such and such a date at the crime scene and it's a that is an exact um, view that I myself viewed that's the way it was when I snapped the picture now if you can prove he wasn't the photographer that took it he would be committing perjury so our position is going to be to get the facts and the law into the court case and testify to them in court any hearing will do it just has to be in court so you're going to testify to it and then that's going to be uh, put into the evidence file and if the judge refuses now he's denied you due process He's not likely to go there, but if for some reason he did, I object, you're denying me due process. You're not allowing me to be heard. I have a right to be heard, and my rights are being denied. Okay, so Robert Fox is very successful, and his position is he does not file motions. He files affidavits. So my imagination is that an affidavit in, some, in support of dismissal of matter number MCV, blah, 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 right? Affidavit in support of a denial of my rights. Whatever it is that, you're, that you would put down as a motion. And as he points out, motions are all crap dreamed up by lawyers. And they have no validity. Because if the motion isn't sworn to under penalty of perjury in front of somebody else, then what is the motion? The motion becomes hearsay evidence. It's a document that was created outside of court and entered into court, and you have to object to it. Unless somebody's going to step up and say, I wrote that and I'm testifying under penalty of perjury that everything in there is true, then it's hearsay, right? I have yet to see a district attorney or an attorney for the bankers or credit card companies step up and say they're willing to swear in and testify. I'm not saying I'll never see it, but I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen the judge play fair. When, I, when the judge denies me the opportunity to speak for a friend of mine, his position will always be, do you have a license to practice law? No, I don't. I demand to see his license to practice law if you're going to deny me the right to speak because you're just made, you just made the statement that unless I had a license to practice law, I couldn't speak for my friend. So the district attorney can't speak for the people of the state of California unless they have a license to practice law. Also, I need to see that license. And the judge flat out refuses to make them produce. What did the judge just do? The judge just showed he was prejudicial against my friend. Because if he's going to make a ruling that if you can't speak for another unless you have a license, and then he's going to apply it to one side and not the other, that's prejudice. So these are the traps you have to show, and it's easy to do, you have to show that the judge is prejudiced. You have to get the evidence that he's prejudiced. If he doesn't step up to the plate and make the statements, and if you don't have a witness in court to write it out on an affidavit that I witnessed the judge exhibit prejudicial behavior against my friend, you know, John Doe, and the prejudicial, be, you know, the prejudicial behavior was on such and such a date. So let's get back to filling out the affidavit. So I'm going to show you the requirements for making a correct affidavit. And I, 
must admit that I learned from Robert Fox a few things that I didn't know before, which is always fun to learn new things. So the requirements of an affidavit for court admissible affidavits. Now, if you're filling out an affidavit just to memorialize something, and it's not going to be entered into court, then, you know, what I did originally in learning how to do affidavits was get this book, which was uh, written by a notary from Florida, Pompiano, and it's a very, you know, detailed book on notary. And in his notary book, he's got a whole um, chapter on doing affidavits. And instead of reading it, okay, my fault, what I did was I looked in there and I noticed that uh, the three or four example affidavits he had all listed, you know, the name of the person as the affiant and that they swore under penalty of perjury or not. You know, maybe it's just an acknowledgement, which is different from a jurat. A jurat means that you swore under penalty of perjury to everything above it. And you, the, in, with a jurat, the notary is supposed to have you hold your hand up and say, do you swear everything on this page is true and correct, so help you God? And you say, yes. There you go. You swore in front of the notary who took your oath. If there's no, not another party taking an oath, then it's uh, it's bogus. I mean, you can swear under penalty of perjury, but but unless you're swearing it in front of somebody else, it's fairly bogus. Now, you can make the argument on religious grounds that Jesus says in the Bible that you shall swear no oaths to any man, right? So I like that, and my attitude is I should, you know, swear no oaths to any man, because if I'm swearing an oath to the clerk of the court, does that mean he's got more authority somehow, that I'm below him, and that he has the uh, ability to say whether what I'm saying is true or not? Why should I swear an oath to him? I should swear an oath to God, right? So, my yea is my yea, and my nay is my nay. That's straight out of the Bible. I swear no oaths to any man, and I swear under penalty of perjury, as God is my witness. So I'm swearing an oath to God that I'm going to be truthful. And I'm letting everyone know that if I'm lying... I will agree to be punished for my lies. So you swear an oath, and the notary book showed that the common words that were required on each of their little notary uh, examples was do, depose, and say. I, so-and-so, you know, do, depose, and say. But then, you know, listening to Robert Fox, he was saying that, that uh, some of the his friend's, uh, a f friend of his uh, affidavit was thrown out of court because, um, because it didn't have the correct wording on it. And I said, oh, that's interesting, because <laughs> naturally I'm curious. So I started reading Pombiano's book, and it was in there. I just hadn't read the chapter, so let me read it to you. Supporting and opposing affidavits for court must be made on personal knowledge and state facts which are admissible as evidence in court. Made on personal knowledge, right? I have personal first-hand knowledge. This is really important. If you don't have personal first-hand knowledge, it's hearsay, because who did you learn it from? You know, I talked to Bob, and Bob told me that Jerry told him that blah, 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 blah. Well, that's Jerry's testimony then. Or even if Bob told you that he witnessed something, that's you, you have to testify that, it, that you witnessed it. We'll have to subpoena Bob if we want to get his testimony. You see? So hearsay is anything that's... that. The person in court isn't swearing that they have personal, first-hand knowledge of. They have to testify it's true and correct, and it's their personal, first-hand knowledge. 
and demonstrate that the affiant, that's the person who's making the affidavit, is competent to testify to the matters of the affidavit, in the affidavit, sworn or certified copies of all papers or parts of them referred to in the affidavit should be attached to it. That unless all of the documents are stapled together, there's a chance that they're fraud, right? Because you can add and take away papers that aren't stapled together. But if you put all your papers together and staple them and then have the notary notarize them, let's say the notary notarizes your affidavit, which is two pages long, and you have three supporting documents, and you put on the page that the affidavit is, is, is uh, two pages and five pages total. Once the uh, notary notarizes it and it's stapled together, then it's a complete document. What happens if you look at the document and it's got staple holes in the paper? If you have staple holes in the paper, you know somebody has removed the staple and separated the pages. And if somebody separates the pages, then they could add different pages. Like, let's say you have a two-page notarization and the notary's uh, jurat or acknowledgement is on the second page. Somebody could have taken the first page and swapped it out for another first page that has different writing on it, right? So beware of any documents you see in court where there are staple holes in the top. Or I've seen uh, certified copies and whatnot where there's little black marks, you know, where the copier shows that there were staple holes in the document. And if you're going to tell me that this is a certified copy and it's got obviously two staple holes that have been removed already, then that's not the original wasn't given to the county recorder to record because somebody took it apart, right? The county recorder is only authorized to record originals. They can't, author, they can't um, put copies into the county recorder's office. You put a grant deed into the county recorder's office that's not an original, and they'll kick it right out. It better have blue ink original uh, signatures on it, and it has to be an original. I'm going to list out your requirements for an affidavit. One, must have first-hand knowledge of what is stated and state that on the affidavit. You want to, your affidavit should state that I'm making this affidavit and swearing to it and having as I have first-hand knowledge of the following. Two, must name the affiant, that's the person testifying, the date, and state the testimony is given under penalty of perjury. Three, must be witnessed and sealed by a notary, or have two or more private parties, men or women, sign. The Bible states a fact is established by two or more witnesses. And I have a footnote one down here, so let me read it. Quote, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Matthew 18.16 from the King James Bible Version. For real estate or other statutory presentments, a notary is required. Four, most state venue, must state venue, the location the affidavit was signed at, usually a county. So, I mean, when you have the notary do it, it'll state in there that, you know, county of Alameda, state of California. It'll show where the notarization took place, at least within the county, right? Because would it count if, it was take, if, if the notary took the affidavit in Japan? Maybe, but, you know, you'd have some differences. Five, quote, this case lacks the standard of regularity, quote, is a good thing to include if there has been what appears to be fraud on the judge's or the DA's part, and forces the court to be thorough in determining whether things were done under the law or not. Or, quote, I am rebutting the presumption of regularity in the matter of matter number such and such, the court case number. In other words, if you've been to court 
and the judge has denied you due process or shown prejudicial favor or refused to enter documents or something like that, you would put that on your affidavit. Six, must have copies of all attachments to the affidavit and be stapled to it. I like to make all of my statements of fact or law individual. So just like a uh, court pleading, I'm going to put the uh, opening summary is going to be you know, dismissal of matter number, whatever. And then I put in there, you know, I, John Doe, sui juris, hereafter, I. So all the statements I below where I state I, you could say hereafter affiant, but then you have to write affiant every time. One of the people with a footnote, number three, a free man on the land on California, not in California, but I'm on California. In this court of record, do depose and say I'm competent to testify and have personal first-hand knowledge of the matters hereafter testified to, and hereby aver the following under penalty of perjury of the laws of California as per the liabilities in Briscoe versus LaHood. And then I make the statements in a number each statement. I am a man, I'm not the legal fiction, right? Not a corporation. On the land, living in abeyance to God's laws as presented in the Bible and under man's laws if and when they are not in conflict with God's laws. Two, I claim all my unalienable rights, some of which are noted in the constitutions of the United States and, the Califor and California and waive no rights or remedies. So you go on to make all of your statements. And then you can see at um, 27, I aver that any alleged California judge must take compulsory judicial notice, and then there's footnote 9, notice of, of all the citations and in the footnotes herein and added by reference. So then what is uh, number 9, California codes on it, and here we have Evidence Code 451, Compulsory Judicial Notice. Judicial notice shall be taken of the following. The decisional, constitutional, and public statutory law of this state and of the United States. And then we go down to D. Uh, the rules of pleading, practice, and procedure prescribed by the United States. You know, the federal rules of civil procedure and criminal procedure. So there you go. The, what's the decisional law? That's all the court case sites with a few twists. The one is that the first thing he does is he files an affidavit of truth. And in his affidavit, he more or less states all of these things, right? I'm competent to testify, and I have firsthand knowledge of the following. And he states in there that he's not the all capital letter name, and therefore there is a misjoinder of parties and a misnomer because the I am not the defendant. So if I'm not the defendant, you can't hold me liable. And he fills this affidavit out and he sends it to the district attorney. And he gives the district attorney 10 days to answer this. When the district attorney fails to answer it, he puts in a notice of default opportunity to cure and gives him another three days to correct his mistake by not answering his affidavit. And upon failure to do that, he goes to the clerk of the court and demands that the clerk give him a certificate of default. The clerk of the court, he has to serve the affidavit on the district attorney and put it into the, put it into the court case. So what the clerk of the court has is a docket showing that, yes, it was served and there was proof of service that the district attorney received it because you got it file stamped and the, you have a, a proof of service from somebody not you not a party to the case who served it on the district attorney and then you put it into the clerk's records now the clerk sees that the district attorney did not answer it and they're required to issue a notice of default I mean, one flaw with this is that there's no law that says they have to answer your um, affidavit within 10 days. If you go to Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and you call it a counterclaim, then in a counterclaim, 
they are required to answer it in 21 days. And if they fail to answer it in 21 days, then you can get a default judgment, which is different from a summary judgment. A default judgment just shows, the record shows that they failed to, they slumbered on their rights and they failed to enter any uh, opposition to your uh, complaint. And once they fail to, op to have an opposition to your complaint, they have defaulted and their default means that they've lost the right to, you know, they have to abide by whatever your complaint says. Your complaint can be that, you know, that I wasn't driving a motor vehicle. There's no factual evidence to support that I was driving a motor vehicle and that I was unlawfully arrested. And that because of this, I'm asking for uh, $5,000 from the district attorney and the police officer for proceeding with a fraudulent claim. And when they don't answer it, you got a default judgment, they both owe you $5,000. Now they can have all, a lot of reasons why they're not going to honor this, but we'll go into that later. Anyway, in Greg Slaughter's Ticket Slayer approach, he files the affidavit officially into the clerk of the court and to the district attorney. And then he gives them the notice of default and an opportunity to cure. And then after the opportunity to cure, he demands that the clerk of the court uh, grant him, give him a certified default judgment. Then when the clerk of the court refuses to do this, because they always do, he writes a writ of precipe, ordering the clerk of the court to do it. The clerk of the court has a ministerial duty, right? They are public servants and they have a duty to enter the default judgment. So when they don't do when they don't answer the writ of presepe and give within three days give him a certified copy, then he writes a writ of mandamus, ordering the judges in the court to order the clerk of the court to issue the default. And when the judges refuse to do that, he shows up at the hearing for the traffic ticket and shows the evidence, testifies that he put in a default judgment and that he's got a writ of press pay and a writ of mandamus and the courts have violated his rights and haven't performed their ministerial duty of giving him a default. And he's got an 85% win rate according to him. I think it's a pretty powerful system. I also think it's a very powerful system using Robert Fox's. Now, the affidavit is almost identical, see? So the bottom line is learn, we have to learn how to do a correct affidavit and then we have to testify to it in court. So another important aspect about the affidavit is that it's supposed to be based on your personal knowledge and everything in there is true and correct. So when you make statements such as my ex-wife threw down the papers in a mean and vindictive manner. Sounds good. You know, that's your statement. However, that's conjecture because you can't state what somebody else is feeling. You see, you're not them, so you don't know what they're feeling. You can only state what you're feeling. So what you would say would be, my ex-wife threw down the papers in what appeared to me to be a ang very angry, mean, and vindictive manner. Now, nobody can tell you what you thought other than you, right? They can't say that you're lying because what you're saying is facts are pretty much devoid of emotion. So in order to get emotion in there, right, you have to state that it appeared to you. It appeared to me that the policeman was overheated and, and um, getting very excited and jumping up and down. See, so what appears to you can't be contested, but it still introduces the emotional aspect of the facts. The next thing that um, Robert Fox does very well is, you know, challenge the authority of the attorney for the other side or the district attorney to speak for the principal. The principal is the plaintiff. So it'd be the state of the people of the state of California or it'd be um, the Bank of America or some other corporation that's suing you, right? They're the principal, they're the plaintiff. 
And in order to be an agent of the plaintiff, the person would have to have a signed power of attorney, right? By, si signed by somebody in a position of authority. And in California, under Business and Professions Code 6067, it states that the oath of office shall be on the back of the license as far as attorneys go. So what that means is that an attorney has to have a license to practice law. One flaw there is that there is no license to practice law issued by the state of California. So they can't produce that. So how do you get it? How do you get it into the record that they don't have a license to practice law? You subpoena their license to practice law. All they can produce is a bar card, and the California State Bar is not part of the state of California. It's a private agency, private corporation that was registered as a corporation in 1901, and then ceased to be in a corporate ceased to be a corporation in California in 1951. So, if you went to the Secretary of State and demanded to see a valid corporation to do business in the state of California, they won't be able to produce that. So subpoenas are very powerful and you need to do them and you need to do your affidavit. And this way, if you can challenge the authority of the agent to represent the plaintiff then and he can't prove agency, then, he, then the minute you go into court and he opens his mouth, the minute the attorney for the other side opens their mouth, I object everything he's saying is hearsay evidence. And he's not allowed to speak until he proves his authority to act on behalf of the principal or on behalf of the plaintiff in this matter. Okay, Patterson versus Home Bank and principal and agent. Proof of relationship testimony of agency. It says testimony. Although agency cannot be proved by the declarations of the agent, his testimony in court as to the agency is admissible to prove both agency and his acts as agent. And this is from the same case. While it is true that agency cannot be proved by the declarations of the professed agent. In other words, if he just says in court that I represent the principal, I represent the plaintiff in this matter, that's not enough. Yet, we see no reason why one who is alleged to be the agent of another may not be allowed to prove by his own direct testimony that he has been appointed Brown's agent by parole. So what they're saying is, is that if he wants to testify sworn, sworn under oath that he's the agent, then that's admissible. However, once he swears in, the other party gets to cross-examine him. And from Patterson versus Home Bank, the exceptions challenge the judgment of the circuit court, circuit court upon two grounds. One, that the court erred in the holding as to the proof of agency, and there is no testimony to support the judgment. See, if you don't testify, then it's not okay. Two, it is axiomatic that agency cannot be proved by the declarations of the agent but that it is far from saying that the agency cannot be proved by the testimony of the agent given in court under oath. So when you claim that the district attorney has no right to represent the people of the state of California, just his de declaration is not enough. He's going to have to swear in and get on the stand and, st and give some kind of proof and evidence that you have a right to cross-examine him on to show that he's an agent. Do you have any first-hand knowledge of any of the information that you're presenting in this case, starting with your original complaint? Because, of course, he's not going to have any first-hand knowledge, so the only person that would have first-hand knowledge is a custodian of records or somebody like that. So always, always, always challenge the authority of the party on the other side.